Hi everyone, today we're going to move into looking at the Neolithic period and how it relates to sustainability. And as I say here on the title of the slides, this really is just an overview. I think what we'll probably do is when we get to our specific civilizations, uh, we will look at this period maybe in a little more detail. Um, okay, so anyway, what is the Neolithic? So the Neolithic literally means new stone. So Neo means new and lith, lithic is um, stone in Greek, so the New Stone Age. Now that's a pretty bad description. Really what it is, it's, it's a period of agriculture. So it's where people learn how to uh, grow plants and domesticate animals. And what this means ultimately is that people weren't moving around um, being hunter-gatherers anymore. They now lived in one spot because that's where their crops and that's where their animals were. Um, and they didn't have to travel for their food. So you have to wonder how the first people started to survive doing this. Um, a couple of points to note here, and it does make a difference in the way we think about things, is that we don't know how agriculture got to start. So there's no writing during this period. So, I have, so we don't have anybody saying uh, in the Middle East, uh, today I discovered wheat. No, there's nothing like that. We only have really archaeology to help us in this early period. And, you know, one thing it's really useful to start thinking about is what is the process of, of growing plants? And I just put a list here that, of things that I just pulled off the top of my head. You know, think of what a plant is. Um, you need to collect the seeds. So you need to know that the plant that you're harvesting and, and eating, you need to collect some of it and store it for next year. Um, you need to know how to plant them. So how deep in the soil, how much water does it need, how much sun, um, what kind of, you know, where are they going to be planted? So there's lots of things that these early humans had to think about in terms of planting crops for the first time. Now, if you do any reading on the Neolithic, you'll get a couple different terms this, that um, is used for this period. So one is, the Neolithic Revolution. So it's a revolution in terms of you go from hunter-gatherers being um, or having dominated such a long period of, of human history to uh, very sh in a very short time uh, people doing agriculture. So sometimes it's referred to a revolution. Uh, sometimes also people might call it, um, is it Neolithic evolution? Meaning it wasn't sort of a uh, turn on the dime switch between hunter-gatherers, but it was more of a long process of trial and error. And more than likely, that's really what happened. It was uh, trial and error. And then, you know, people spread around and spread the ideas of farming and domesticated animals to other, to other places. Um, I really like this quote in terms of moving into the Neolithic. So fundamental changes in the relationship between natural processes and human activities occur over a long period of time as we pass from nature dominated to human dominated environment. So that's really what the Neolithic is about, where humans start dominating their environment as opposed to the other way around where they're dominated by it. Um, one thing too, when you think about the Neolithic and when you read about it, um, other questions will pop up, um, and I've got one here. You know, was it society or climate that triggered this revolution? Meaning, um, did a group of people, if it was society, did a group of people sort of sit down and think about what to do to get more food, or did the climate change and they had to react to it? Did it get warmer, drier, colder, wetter? Um, and as I put here, this is the big question, and I will warn you that the answer varies depending on who you're reading. So a lot of the articles I popped up in the bibliography um, really mix the answer up. It was a bit um, society, and it was a bit um, triggered by climate. But you will get articles that claim it was one or the other. So right now, the question's up in the air. It'll probably be up in the air for a very long time. Okay. And then what I want you to start thinking about is the effects of the Neolithic. So um, how did people farming affect lots of different things? And of course, this class is on sustainability. So we have to think about how did it affect land use? Um, when people start planting, it usually means they take down trees or the native grasses that are there. They 
uh, tear up the earth and then they pop their plants in the ground. How does that affect land? Um, of course, plants need water. If you don't live in a spot where you're lucky enough to get water um, falling from the sky or a stream, you have to divert water. And, and what does that do? And then, of course, you also have to talk about pollution. Um, when people moved into the Neolithic, they um, live, started living in larger and larger groups. And there's lots of really interesting research out there about what this did to humans. Um, and one thing, you know, we're not, this isn't a parallel, but we're, we're sort of living in the COVID period um, where health and or disease in particular is really affecting human society. Now, when people were first moving into the Neolithic, you have to think about that. People were living closer um, the chance of catching something from somebody else greatly increases and how do people um, handle that? Another really interesting thing to think about is social interaction. So before people um, were hunter gatherers, probably living in groups of no more than 20 or 30 at the very most. And they usually stayed in those groups unless they got, they got together for you know, like a hunting. Now living in a village, you are having to interact with other people in ways that you didn't have to before and you're helping other people or hurting if you're going to war. So the Neolithic changed a lot in terms of what, how humans were living. And as I say here, it's important to really understand or try and understand what these early people are doing because what they did to the land back then um, could have affected the way that we are using the land now. Okay, and I mentioned this just a little bit earlier, but I just want to uh, make sure you're really thinking about it. You know, what's the process for agriculture? Um, and then what we'll look at is, can we measure it? Like, how do we know that people were actually planting crops? So there's lots of ways that we can look at this. Um, obviously, there's some type of land clearing. I'll show you a few tools in just a few minutes where that people used early on before the use of metal plows. So land clearing cutting down trees, cutting down brush, grass, dig up the ground um, for your seeds. And of course, you want to protect these. So you're pulling up um, weeds. Um, you're getting rid of animals that might eat your crops in some way or the other. Um, when you over clear the land, um, I just call that sort of naked ground or naked land, um, it, you can get problems with erosion. So there's a whole process of learning how to treat um, um, soil when you are starting to farm for the first time. Okay, in terms of land use in the Neolithic, and this certainly um, is true for the other time periods that we'll be looking at, um, there are different types of crops that people used. And we'll, we'll probably look at animal use later. Right now, I just want to think about um, crops in particular. So you've got tree crops, so like nuts, say for example. Um, that people can and, and did grow. You've got field crops, and in particular, wheat and barley were some of the most common um, plant sources for food all over when you're looking at um, the Neolithic. And then you've got areas for pasture, which were mostly for animals. And then another way to think about how land use is being used, especially with these you know, field crops, trees, and pasture, is diet. So how many people do you have that you have to farm for? Um, what kind of food can you grow? Now, it all depends on your environment, um, which is what, what determines what you can grow and how you can grow it and how much. Um, there are other things too, agricultural pro, um, practices. So early on, you probably wouldn't get a lot of land damage with these digging sticks, and I'll show you a few in just a minute. But once you get to the point of having metal um, hose or metal plows and really digging up the land, that can change what you can grow and how much you can grow and so on. Another thing that determines land use is the type of animals. And of course, that's again, is really based on where you're living. So the use of cows and cattle or pigs or sheep, that, that type of thing. Another thing to think about in terms of land use is industrial activities. So lots of uh, Neolithic societies were starting to get into metallurgy, which is the use of metals. So mining in particular, which you know is, you know, digging a hole in the ground usually, and then digging up all these different things to um, smelt or into metals. So you have to think about that in terms of land use. And then 
Another thing that um, will really affect land use is what, what I've just called commercial activities. So, and I've listed a few things here, like items for export. So where maybe you grow too much food and then you can export it somewhere else, or you're growing food primarily just for export. Um, shipbuilding. So we'll talk about that. Um, I don't know if we'll do it this lecture, but probably the next lecture. And certainly when we get to Egypt, when they're starting to build ships, you know, that's cutting down trees from somewhere, bringing them, building the boats and so on. And then lots of other commercial activities like building large buildings, monumental architecture, meaning like a pyramid that's monumental, it's huge. So all those things go into thinking about how we use the land. Um, and I've given you here this, this chart, which I've taken from an article called Medieval Land Use. And this just, what you can do is, let me see if we get my little pen working here. Uh, let me change the color. So it's probably good to start on this side with land use types. So you've got pasturage and then what kind of specific animals and things that you can do with a pasture. And then these are sort of the general categories, what they call the main parameters. So pasture, you know, chickens, what can you make with all these things? Milk, cheese, and so on. Um, you've got field crops. So I've mentioned wheat and barley. You've got lentils and peas. All of these things people in the Neolithic um, learned how to grow. And then you've got these cereals or grasses, millet, oat, rye, and so on. Um, then you've got tree crops. So firewood used for lighting. Um, you've got tree crops where you're growing them essentially for nuts or fruit, um, peaches, apples, figs, and so on. Um, and then another thing, you know, we talked about was metal, metal working, how that affects the land. And then you've got something called um, cultivation strategy, like how you're going to grow enough to not only eat, but to store it for next year. Um, and that also includes using things like animals. So all that's involved in thinking about what people had to deal with when they were thinking about the land. Okay, so the important question is, um, can we see this land use impact during the Neolithic? And the answer is definitely yes. So um, a couple lectures ago, we looked at the list of sources that you can pull from, mostly archeology span in the early period, um, and there's still the case here. So you can use pollen, um, um, Anthropogenic, that just means used by people. Um, pollen indicator. So really what it means is plants that are being used by people. And you can measure the pollen. Um, there's a couple, there's lots of different types of pollen you can look at, but one's called the OJC group. Um, and I've just defined these. So olea, which are olive. Um, the juglans, which is walnut. And castagna, which is chestnut. So those are plants that people grew on purpose to use for growing. And then you also get the vetus, which is the grape, and then the uh, corylus, which is the hazelnut. So when you see that type of pollen in large amounts, it usually indicates that people are, are growing something specific that they're, they're going to eat. Um, and we'll look at some of those studies in just a bit. And then you also get cereal pollen. So where you've got wheat, barley, oats, rye, and so on. So you can see the pollen records in the soil. Um, you can look at remains of wood, and this is both natural wood, if you're lucky enough to find it, or charcoal, where someone has burned a specific type of wood, and there's lots of studies that look at charcoal, where they sort of dissect it, um, and you can tell what type of um, trees the wood is coming from. And another thing we will look at in this lecture is erosion evidence, where if there's a lot of farming going on, um, that can show up in water flow areas where, um, you know, if it rains a lot, it can really um, make these little divots in the soil. So that soil moves somewhere and we can look at evidence in different layers of how much erosion was happening at certain times and see, and you can correspond that to when there's large populations of people or populations of people doing agriculture. Okay, so just one example here is some of the charcoal and pollen remains um, in northern Greece. And I, I've just taken some data here, and these dates are in BP, so before present. So about 5,000 um, BP or 3,000 BC. 
you start to see evidence of this land, uh, human land interaction, meaning people are starting to farm. Um, what's interesting is that we know that there were farmers before this period and you don't see um, a lot of this same evidence. So they're probably not farming as intensively as they are a little bit later. And that makes sense because we know um, that populations start to expand. So that means more farming. Um, if you look at these records, you see around 4,000 BP or 2,000 um, BC, you've got evidence of people planting things to eat. And it's the same, almost the same group that I just talked about. Um, and you also see evidence of beech trees showing up. Now, beech is a tree that will sometimes start growing in places that had been um, a different type of tree before, like oak. If someone chopped down oak trees for, say, building or fire building, um, and then left the land sitting there, beech trees would, would usually grow up um, in some places, not every place, but in some places you get beech showing up. So sometimes you can see that in the pollen levels, where earlier you might see a whole bunch of pollen from oak, and then you don't see the pollen from oak, but you see beech. So it indicates some type of probably human use, not always. Um, what's interesting in Northern Greece, and this is the same for a lot of other places, and I note that here, um, you don't get a complete destruction of the woodland. So you still get, say, oak pollen. Um, so are we talking about maybe forest management? Like, do they realize that when they cut down these, these massive oaks, if they don't allow new ones to grow, do they realize they won't have any oak um, in 50 years down the road? We're not quite sure, um, but, and I also brought this point up um, from up above, you know, maybe farming didn't have a large impact on the land in Northern Greece. Maybe there were um, slightly open areas close to the oak trees or close to the forests, and they left the forests alone. That's probably unlikely, but you never know. And as I point out here, and I just said it, you do find this evidence in other places throughout uh, the Mediterranean. Now, in terms of land use, I did want to bring up um, Neolithic housing. So what it looks like in certain places. And what I've done is I've taken some um, information from a book called The Early Neolithic in Greece. And this picture is part of the wall system that was used in um, this particular area. So this is called Wad, um, uh, Waddle and Daub Walls. So where you've got um, uh, wood here, and then what they've done is they've weaved the wood around other sticks, and then they put a mud, a mud wall up usually stones at the bottom to hold hold up the walls. So what you have here are really post houses where these are the posts. Whoops, sorry, it wasn't very straight, but these are the posts with timber frames. Now think about it in terms of sustainability. If you've got a whole bunch of these houses in different areas around Greece, they're built out of wood. Where do you get the wood from? You go out into the hills or the, you know, the areas where there are trees and you cut them down. Um, you also have to think about um, the job, which is the mud. Um, where, where are you getting that? Now, there, are, there is evidence of mud brick houses without timber. So usually in this early period, um, these are built in areas based on uh, the geography. So if there's not a lot of timber and it's not easy to access or there's no trade, you might get houses made out of mud brick because mud is found in certain, um, certain areas. Um, you also get something called pit houses where they're partially dug like maybe three feet into the ground and then they put up timbers and then the, um, walls are built out of whatever, uh, whatever it is. Now, when you're thinking about sustainability, so you've got all these things, you know, there's, there's posts and there's branches being used and there's mud being used and stone. Um, then you have to think about size because that informs you about how much volume you're really talking about. So some of these, um, the smaller ones, smaller houses were 18 feet by 24 feet, um, ranging up to 24 by 24 feet. Now that's fairly large. So think about the amount of wood you might need to build just one of those. Um, some of the buildings had more than one room. And what that meant is you had to put posts down in some way. So that's more wood. And then you build, um, your, your walls and so on. So on. And in some of them, you had shelves, benches, storage. 
uh, made out of mud or stone, or in some cases made out of wood. So all these things we, st we have to start thinking about in terms of sustainability. Um, now, this is just a list and we just talked about some of this. So what you needed to make a house. So lumber, clay, um, chaff is like the, the material that you would, uh, like grasses you chop up and mix with the clay to make it harder, and then branches. Now, in the, in the study I was just talking about, a lot of these are obtained locally. So right now, at least for this particular study, they're not um, trading with lumber from very far away. There are stone tools on the site. And this can tell you a little bit about sustainability in terms of trade. So it looks like in this particular study from Greece, you've got imported stone for tools. So they bring in stone from somewhere else and it's probably finished on site based on the archeology, span meaning they might have a, a big chunk of say obsidian, which is a very hard, sharp stone. Uh, if you crack it, it can make a nice sharp edge. And it looks like based on archeological evidence from these sites, it was probably done on site and then used there. And then just remember, you know, this study that I just talked about is only in Greece. There's lots of other places where you can find similar things happening. Okay, in terms of tools, um, this of course relates to sustainability because the type of tool you have determines the land use. So um, this particular study is coming out of Spain and I've given you the title of the, um, the journal that I'm pulling out some of this information on. Um, this is a digging stick. So now maybe what I should have done is turn the picture the other way because you would pick this thing up, use the, use the two um, things like handles, and then this is the spot that would go into the ground. So you'd pick it up and either dig or usually you'd push it back and forth, make a hole and then pop your, your seed or your plant in. Um, some of these are pretty simple. They're just a stick you might pull off a tree and start using. Um, some of them, there's evidence that they were, they were split on purpose to make these. And some of them um, had weights on the end, which would make it easier if you're pounding up and down. Um, if you're thinking about sustainability, at least in this particular study from Spain, there's lots of different woods that I think this study um, had 44, if I remember correctly, um, digging sticks that they found at this particular site. Um, most of them or all of them were grown within the local area, so they weren't brought in. So people were going out foraging, finding the, the type of wood they wanted to use or the shape, probably more importantly, bringing it back and then using it as a digging stick. Also, you get these really neat um, stone tools being used. So stone sickles, like um, something like this one, where you're going to grab this and more than likely you're gonna grab the plant, uh, if I can get my hands in the camera, grab the plant and then chop it off with this stone tool or saw it, because as you can see, there's sort of teeth um, embedded into these stone tools. Um, you could have these stone reaping knives, which are, which are these, almost like sickles. Um, and then they're made out of various stone. So in, a, in some of these places, they're imported. Some of the stone you can find on, on site. Um, other tools that we find being used are grinding tools. Um, so you've probably seen, now I'm of course blanking on what it's called. You've got a bowl, mortar and pestle, where you've got the bowl and then you've got the thing that um, pounds down whatever you're working, whatever you're making, like making salsa or, or whatever it is. Um, you find these um, in Neolithic sites, especially the grinding stones where you've got a stone on the bottom, you put the grain on top of it and then you put another stone on top and then you, you turn it somehow, turn it back and forth. And then the stuff that comes off is the grain that you can use, say for bread, the ground up grain. You also have storage vessels usually made out of pottery. And of course, you know, thinking about sustainability, you are using mud from the rivers for building your houses, you're using mud for making pottery and so on. And um, this particular slide will end this, um, this um, lecture on Neolithic part one. Um, I will do another lecture for the second half of this.